I have I have an ancient book by my standards in my bookcase here in the office and it was uh, last week when I was actually preparing for the lesson last week I had pulled it out and and uh, you know there's times when you're you're kind of wavering a little bit about where to go and, and what direction to take for study and the lesson and last week I was pretty confident in the direction but I really felt uh, when I was reading through <clears throat> that ancient book it's D.L. Moody's Notes from My Bible it's just a, a handbook I have and and usually what I'll do is that when my message is prepared or when I'm preparing the message I'll pull it down to see what inspiration that old-time preacher had on a certain subject or on a certain topic and you can go through bib the Bible just a uh, just book by book and chapter by chapter and verse by verse but in the end he has a little section called notes from my Bible and uh, he just has little miscellaneous thoughts and uh, it was one of those miscellaneous thoughts that that I read that I thought to myself I need to, to bring that to the church family um, until I am a place called Hebron now, well, I know that we know where Bethlehem is, and I know we know Bethel, and I know that we know about uh, all, you know, many places in Scripture have significance, and, but uh, I, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone preach on a topical study on Hebron. Not Hebrew, Hebron. Hebrew, Hebrews is that New Testament book, or Hebrews is Tim Hortons. It's Hebrews a lot, coffee. But this is Hebron, Hebron. And by definition, it means a community, an alliance. Biblically, we find it to be a city in the south end of the Valley of Eshkol, about midway between Jerusalem and Beersheba, about 20 miles apart from those two places. And, and it still exists under the same name today. It's one of the most ancient cities in the world. And it has powerful significance, biblically and scripturally so. I wonder if we would turn, I already asked you to turn to Genesis 13, verse 18. It says, Then Abram moved, removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Built there an altar unto the Lord. I think Hebron can become a place and needs to become a place in every one of our lives that allow us to the opportunity to get spiritual direction, navigation, and an anchor in our spirit to the place that God wants to bring us or keep us. Yeah. Someone say, God bless his word, the reading of it and the preaching of it. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. If you'll read from Genesis chapter 13, the beginning of the chapter, you'll find that Abraham was very rich. Riches, um, and some of you, I yeah, just got your attention. But I'll say that riches don't just buy stuff. Often they bring strife. Riches also stir up a spirit of contention by making people proud and covetous. And mine and thine are two words that seeds land in the soil of those words and cause us to compare ourselves among ourselves. And Scripture already tells us that's not wise. It's not good when we start drawing a comparison, a line in the sand, and then picking how many rocks we have on our side of the soil versus how many rocks he or she has on their side of the soil. Us compare, comparing bank balances or what's in people's yards or people's yards, period. It's not good to compare ourselves among ourselves because if we do believe in the providence of God, he is going to provide us with what we need when we need it in his time. And his plan is perfect, so if you trust God, you won't always be seeking riches. Abraham had a lot of stuff, but it brought him a lot of problem. Lot was a fatherless son, and Abraham was a sonless father. And in that vacuum in each life, two individuals came together. And, and I'm not even confident, and I think if we look back through Scripture, we'll know that it wasn't a good combination. Their lack brought them together, and, uh, and when it did, it was a powerful bond. They, they stayed together through travels and seasons of poverty and labor, through wants and wanderings, and, and none of that could separate Abraham and Lot until they became rich. Riches separated them. 
In verse 12, Lot pitches his tent towards Sodom. He picks the well-watered plains of Jordan. And even though Genesis 13 and 13 give us this backdrop, the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. In his sense of Lot and in his search for what to do next, God shows up. God allows Abraham, and it's in your little handout if you want to write down a place of separation. God brings Abraham to a place of separation. He separates him from the things that were comfortable, the things that he knew, the things that he had known. And he brings him apart from all that. I am sure that the bond between Lot and Abraham was great. I'm confident that they loved one another. But God allowed this little division to come amongst them and, and their blessings became a point of bickering and, and it eventually separated that strong bond that they had, but not without a great purpose. And Abraham, he doesn't, ha he doesn't take first choice. He, he gives Lot the first option of where he would like to dwell. And, and Lot picks the well-watered plains of Jordan. I'm going to pick the, the lush pasture. I'm going to pick the spot where the, uh, the stream flows through and everything's growing in abundance and, and it's the comfort zone for him. But we know that lot, that choice that he made had great impact, spiritual impact and personal impact in his life. And Abraham is forced to pick everything up and move and separate himself from the thing and the one that he loved, Lot. But God never takes things out of our life without bringing something to us. Lot was separated from him. But God sometimes adds to our life by blessed subtraction. It was only when Abraham lost Lot that he heard the voice of God come to him. And God said, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. And Abraham brushes the dust off of his memories, and Abraham brushes the dust off of his robe, and he gets up, and he removes his tent, and the scripture says, came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and there built an altar unto the Lord. Hebron wasn't just a place that separated Abraham from what he had, from what he was, from the people that he knew. It was a place that separated Abraham unto God. People sometimes, we, we call, we, 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 we say that we are people of separation, come out from the world and be ye separate, saith the Lord. We are, we are called to a life of separation, but don't stand around looking at what you may have lost. Turn around and look at the option that God has put before you. Don't get kind of bound by, by what you gave up. What a, what a mindset that the devil would like to bring to you. I wish that we could just kind of turn our gaze completely around. No wonder God told Lot, the angel said, don't turn around. Don't look back to Sodom. You, do, you don't need what it's got. You don't want to have any connection to it. And church, i got to tell us that we've got to turn around from the thing that God brought us out of. When God separated us from sin and when God separated us from the world, it wasn't to take anything from us. It was to release us into the pen potential that God had for us. What a promise. It's not about what we lose, it's what we gain. And separation is the opportunity for us to walk into the benefits and the blessings that God has for us. Hebron in our life, if it represents separation, we've got we've to have that initial repentance. We've got to have that initial move toward the plan and the mind of God. We've got to separate ourselves from the world. And this whole thing, this whole relationship with God starts in a place called Hebron for us. A place of separation. Number two, a place of worship. Abraham built an altar to the Lord. The first thing that he did, he didn't build fences for his sheep. He didn't kind of pen all of his oxen and his cattle all up. He didn't kind of do a head count of, of the people that were with him. He, he didn't do any of that. 
The scripture tells us that when he got to Hebron, he built an altar unto the Lord. And I think that if Abraham's heart could resonate with us tonight, he would let us know, we would know, that he wanted to worship God with everything that he had. Hebron is a place of worship. A place of worship. We need altars in our life. How many still have your little rock? Sister Vonnie gave us. We need the word and we need prayer. That, that rock signifies so much something so much bigger than just a stone you can hold in your hand. It signifies an altar that you can lay your life at. It signifies an altar that you can place your heart on. It signifies an altar that you crucify yourself daily to Christ because we need an altar in our life. If Abraham's laying out the benchmark for us, if he's showing us the groundwork that needs to happen in our life, then the number one responsibility as soon as we separate ourselves unto God is that we develop an altar in our life, that we've got a place of consecration, that we've got a place where we bow our knee and we talk to God, where we hear from his word and we hear his word come to us, that God's word speaks to us and we speak to him, a place of worship. We need altars in our life, a place of prayer, and praise a place of separation and a place of sanctification we need an altar in our life someone say I need an altar you may not know how to sing maybe you do maybe some of us think we know and we really don't I tell people all the time I can't sing Kathy can I just try and fill in the blanks I can hit a few notes that she can't and sometimes at the right time <laughs> but whether anyone's listening or no one's listening then we need to have a place of worship whether that's singing or reading the word or finding a scripture in psalms that resonates with how you're feeling and then you just begin to to talk to god about it you need a place of worship in your life a place an altar that you can talk to god we need that on a daily basis scripture says when you pray not if you pray, when you pray. We need, a, we need an altar. If we're, if we're going to separate ourselves from the world, then God is calling us to a greater thing, and, and we miss out if we don't take time to meet with God. We need an altar in our life. Hebron is a place of worship. Number three, it's a starting point for victory. It's a starting point for victory. Now, if you read through, <clears throat> through the scripture, chapter 13 or chapter 14, you'll find that, that <clears throat> if I was Abraham, I may have done things a little bit differently because I can hold a grudge maybe sometimes. I don't know. I try and keep Jack under subjection. But there are times when he rises up and you got to crucify him, kill him, put him back down. But Abraham, if you can imagine, Lot picks the great well-watered plains and he, uh, he fights with Abraham. But time comes, verse, verse 12 of chapter 14 tells us that, that there's a war of nations and kings come together and, and fight and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah are, are in the midst of this battle and, and uh, they're on the losing end. The slime pits take their, their toll on the, in the war and, and Lot, it says, is, is taken along with Abram's brother. And it says that in the midst of that battle of, of, of the people that were taken hostage and the stuff that was uh, removed and stolen by the enemy, it says that there was one that escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre. He, he was in Hebron. It says that when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, um, he said, I told Lot, he knows better. No, that's not what he said. Um, Lot shouldn't have fought me. That's not what he said. Lot, Lot shouldn't have, shouldn't have um, dishonored his elders. That, that's not what he said. Abraham, wise old Abraham, loving Abraham, when he hears that Lot has been taken captive, it says that he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. He goes to war. It's a starting place for victory. It's a starting point for victory. Hebron is a starting point. And we don't know of Abram as being this mighty warrior until now. We don't know him of, of him as a, a commander in chief. But I tell you, when, when push comes to shove, you never know what God will commission you to do. 
When, when push comes to shove, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord is going to lift up a standard. And when God raises that standard in your life, can I, can I encourage you? Go after it wholeheartedly. Let God lead you and direct you into the place that he's guiding you because he wants to bring victory. The enemy doesn't have a right to take control. God wants to bring you victory. And so we, we know that he pursues them unto Dan and he divided himself against them he and his servants by night and smote them and pursued them unto Hoba which is on the left hand of Damascus and he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people Abraham is victorious through God mighty through God to the pulling down of that stronghold of the enemy can I tell you that God in in that Hebrew place in your life when you bring uh, about a place of separation and you come into a place of worship and an altar is built in your life and you never know what God is going to commission you to do. You never know the victory that God has on the other side of that separation, that sanctification, that point of blessing. God is going to equip you and use you to do some mighty things through God. Amen. It's a starting point of victory. Hebron can become that place in your life. Number four, a place of communion. It wasn't just uh, that place that Abraham had separated. And I, I'm moving quickly. Really, my, my goal is to get you back in the book a little bit later on. Read some of these stories. Get encouraged by them. Get challenged by them. Bring them into your own life. We've got uh, 13 places or, yeah, places to, to visit here over the next few minutes. So how many are with me? If you preach hard with me, I'll go fast. The place of communion. The Bible tells us in chapter 18, verse 1, that the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Hebron was that place of communion with God where God showed up to Abraham. A place of communion with God. Jacob had Bethel, but Abraham, Abraham had Hebron. As a matter of fact, if you read through scripture, one of Abraham's favorite places was Hebron. It's a place of separation, as we've already mentioned. It's a place of worship. It's a place where God commissions you and enables you. But it's a place where God communes with you. I'm so glad that we don't do all this without any response from God. When we were in China, we had the privilege of being with um, our missionaries there, Brother Dave and Sister Debbie and and uh, one of the, we were only there for, I think it was maybe not even 30 hours. We, were, we flew in one evening and back out the next. Um, we were just on our way. Pastor and I were on our way to Malaysia for a conference there and then to Singapore for teaching there. And, and it was just kind of like, we can do this, so let's do it. Slip over into China. And uh, when we went into China, we had that one day with the Curtises. And, and in that day, they took us around to different areas in different locations in China. And one of the places that they took us was this Buddhist temple. And I watched as people worshipped in the Buddhist temple. I watched as they lifted their voice. I watched as they were exuberant. I watched as they bowed down and they over and over again with incense burning. And there was, a, there was a, an, an altar there, um, probably as big as this square section on the platform, that was visited every hour of the day by people. And they would light these incense sticks and they would put them in this altar and there was a you could feel the heat coming off of this area that the incense sticks were burning there was hundreds of them in there and leftovers from people that had been there through the day and, and it was just this place of worship and this place where people were crying out to buddha can i tell you that there was no response from buddha whatsoever there was no community there was communication one way but there was no communication coming back. There was no communion in the communication. But it's so much different with us when we talk to God. God talks to us. His voice comes to us. His spirit meets us. I, I felt him already in this service as we begin to reach out, as we begin to sing, as we begin to pray. We, we were operating by our own effort and by our own strength. But as we begin to call on the name of Jesus for a problem that was greater than we were, I felt his spirit touch in this room. Why? Because this isn't a one-way street. But God chooses to meet with us. His presence comes and shows up. Those people in that temple would never have the experience that we've already had the privilege to have tonight. It's a great privilege 
to commune with God. But, but God showed up. Abraham did all this work of separation, and the Lord appeared unto him. He came right to his tent door. We would never, uh, communion is the word that sometimes we just kind of relegate that to the plastic cup and the emblem and, and that uh, New Year's Eve service or a few services through the year. That, but communion is so much more than that. Communion can happen right now. Communion can happen first thing in your morning. Com- communion can happen on your coffee break. You can meet with God anytime, anywhere, any place. God can meet with you. We would never relegate communion to a tiny plastic emblem or a service. But it's just as bad if we relegate communion with God to the time that we have together in this room. We need to extend and expand our communion to seasons and time through the day, every single day. I read a tweet by Pastor Terry Shock. He said, it would be amazing what could happen at church if we were more focused on connecting people with Jesus than church. We, we, we get pretty good at the church thing, and if we're not careful, we begin to think that we're connecting people to church, and that becomes a substitute for connecting them to Jesus. But communion is about connecting people with God and helping them realize that that can happen any time. That can happen in more than Wednesday night service or Sunday morning or Saturday night prayer or Sunday night or a special service. That happens in a daily activity with God. If we connect people with Jesus, then they can meet with him anytime. He can show up in their life at any point. A place of communion. We need a place of communion in our lives. So forgive us if we've got this wrong. If we've, in our attempt to connect you with Jesus, we just connected you to church. If we can rewind the tape and Whatever we did wrong, can we show you how to do it right? Because we, we don't want to just connect you to this building. We love being a, people being a part of our church, and we love opening the doors, and any brand new person is welcome here the moment they step on campus. But the goal, the intention, the desire isn't to connect you with 71 Downing Street. The, de- the desire and the goal that we have is to connect you with an eternal, almighty, saving, delivering God. That is where communion happens. That is what needs to happen in our life. Amen. A place of communion. I wonder if you would do that right now with me. Would you just pause? I know you guys are helping me work through the notes. And, but I wonder if we would just kind of let go of that for a second and just talk to God for a minute. Because I, I believe that God may want to talk to somebody right now. The, the lights may have just come on for someone. They, they, they may have just realized that, that this communion isn't something that just happens here amongst a group of people in a certain time, but that God can meet with them at any point. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, God. I give you praise. God, meet with us tonight. Meet with us in this room. God, let your presence flow freely, God. I pray that you would meet with someone tomorrow morning, God. In their waking hours, I ask that you would talk to them. God, that you would direct them. Order our steps, Jesus. God, be the friend to the friendless. Be strength to the weary, I pray. It's amazing to me that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they took a stand, God showed up. They didn't intend for it. They weren't expecting it. And I just really believe that 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 could happen for someone tonight. That maybe you didn't expect it, you didn't anticipate it, but when you separate yourself, when you do that work of separating and standing up and, and being called to that level of commitment, and that God, God will meet with you. He won't leave you alone. God will meet with you. Number five, Hebron is a place of promise. The same chapter, verse 9 of chapter 18, Genesis, it says, And they said unto him, 
this angelic encounter that Abraham had. They, they asked Abraham, they said, where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind them. We know that Sarah laughed because she couldn't believe. But that promise was so far-fetched and unbelievable that it literally made this elder lady laugh. Because it seemed like an impossibility, but God's promises happen in the place of impossibility. Hebron is a place of promise. And so you never know when you allow your life to come into that place of Hebron. When you have communion with God and you have a place of worship, an altar. When you have a place of separation. When you allow all those things to be a part of your life. And God will bring impossible, unbelievable, amazing promises to come to pass. It was the place of promise, chapter uh, 18 and verse 9. You can read about that. God promised Abraham that he would have a son. God has a promise for people here in this room tonight. I preached a little bit about it on Sunday morning about waiting until that season of, of waiting, that season where we're interceding, that season where we're requesting, that season where we're asking. But God's promise will come. Sarah laughed because it seemed like an impossibility. Time had already gone by. Human standards ruled the promise out. But God's standards worked the promise in. It's a place of promise Hebron, it's a wonderful place. Number six, it's a place of intercession. When God, because of the sin of the people in the cities nearby, Sodom and Gomorrah, he indicated that destruction was coming. And, and Abraham allowed his life to become that of an intercessor. Genesis 18, verse 23, Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? He said, Peradventure there be 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked? God, you wouldn't do that. And that the righteous should be judged, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And we know the story that Abraham prays that if he finds 50 righteous, that, that God would spare the city. And God agrees. And, and he said, well, you know, and, and you know that he, he works his way down, you know. And he's down to 30 by uh, verse 30. And, and if you keep going down, 20, he said, don't destroy the city for 20's sake. If there's 20 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, then will you not judge the city? And then finally, he gets down to 10. And God said, I, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. But we know through Scripture that there wasn't even 10 righteous in the city. And God's destruction came. But Abraham was willing to plead with God and to call on God for deliverance. He was willing to intercede. If Hebron is a part of our spiritual base, then we will be intercessors. Then we'll cry out for God to save whoever is left to be saved. Intercession is a powerful thing. And I hope, uh, I, hope, I hope that we make room for intercession. Like Pastor mentioned, he said intercessors, the, you know, they, the one-hour prayer meeting drives them crazy because they're just getting fired up. By the time we get to the 40-minute mark, they're just getting into, into, into overdrive. And we call people back to the music. But intercession is that powerful force of breaking when the Spirit breaks through and you pray prayers that you can't utter because the Spirit prays through you. It's that season of prayer when words don't make sense and groanings and utter, are uttered. That's, that's just all that you can, you can let out. There's power in intercession. 
Things are birthed in intercession. When Zion travailed. And we need to build time into our life and time into our calendar and time into the things that we do to intercede, to let intercession be a part because it's part of Hebron. If we're going to allow Hebron to be a part of our life, then Hebron is a place that we intercede from. Intercession. Intercession breaks down walls that we couldn't break down in the natural. Intercession breaks through barriers that we couldn't preach through if we tried. Intercession is that powerful force in prayer that releases the spiritual floodgates of new birth into our midst. We need intercessors. Would someone say amen? Amen. Hebron is a place of fruitfulness. Moses has sent uh, 12 spies into the land. I find it interesting, Numbers chapter 13, that it says that they ascended by the south, came into Hebron. And they came to the brook of Eshkol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff. And they brought of it the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel had cut down. That place of fruitfulness. Can I tell you that fruitfulness follows intercession in our life? We're just kind of tracking through this place of Hebron, but... But fruitfulness comes as a result of us being willing to intercede. If we just kind of let this be a map for us to follow, if we let this just kind of be a trail, a, a, a GPS trail in, 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 the, in the word of God for us to track through, then, then we will see some great and powerful things happen. A place of fruitfulness. It was that place in the land that, that they found those powerful, uh, that powerful place of fruitfulness was, was in Hebron, and, and Hebron is a place of fruitfulness in our life. It isn't just all separation. It isn't all just intercession. It's not all, it's not all the, the difficult, challenging parts of life. There's fruitfulness in Hebron. There's a, Hebron is a place of blessing. He's, Hebron is a place of excitement. Hebron is a place where we get to receive that blessing from God. It's a wonderful place. Don't shun away from Hebron because we're talking about the challenges that it brings to our life. Hebron is a place of blessing. It's a place of fruitfulness. Uh, Joshua carries it on. In Joshua chapter 10, it was a place of conquest. Uh, it says that Joshua went up from Eglin and all of Israel with him unto Hebron, and they fought against it. And he's, now remember, Joshua is capturing, recapturing this ancient territory for God and it says and they took it and smote it with the edge of the sword and the king thereof and all the cities thereof and all the souls that were there and he left none remaining according to all that he had done to Eglon but utterly destroyed it and all the souls that were therein and he redeems it he brings it back into the household of Israel that household of faith and Hebron becomes a place of conquest the reason that we still have a city of Hebron today because of that, that ancient city's name has, re has lived on, lived through territories and lived through a name change and then back to Hebron because was because God has hand on that place. It was a, a spiritual significant place, but, but because Joshua brought it back to Israel. He brought it back to that household of faith. He allowed it to become, and, and, and Hebron in our life, it's a place of conquest. It's a place of spiritual victory. Anybody got some territory you want to take in God? Anybody got some land you want to, to redeem for his sake? Anybody got, got someone that you know right now is on the outside that you know needs to be on the inside? I'm telling you that if we let Hebron be a part of our life, then we are willing to go in and take it and smite it with the edge of the sword and the kings thereof, the enemy is defeated. We can have victory in Christ at place of conquest if Hebron is in our life. It's a place of conquest. Number nine, it's a place... A refuge, refuge. We know that the cities of refuge were six Levitical towns in the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, in which the, the perpetrators of manslaughter could claim the right of asylum. The Torah names six cities as being cities of refuge. There's Golan, Ramoth, Bozor, and then on the east, that those are on the east of the Jordan River, and then Kadesh, Shechem, and Hebron are on the western side of the river. And uh, these cities of refuge, each of them were within 35 miles of wherever you were in Israel. You could reach one. And, and for the person that uh, was, a, was a slayer of a man or accidentally or, or, or until a judgment could be ruled, if someone was killed, whoever killed that person could run to the city of refuge and be safe. I'm telling you that Hebron can become a place of refuge in our life. 
Hebron is a place of refuge. When, when something happens and sin is committed, God doesn't throw us out with the trash, but he allows us to flee to a place of refuge, a place where we can <clears throat> claim the power of the blood, where we can call on his name and we can ask for forgiveness, where, where we can ask to be redeemed, where sin no longer has the toll, takes the toll in our life that it needs to take. But we can allow it to become a place of refuge. We can allow our lives to be saved in spite of what's happened. How many are grateful that the blood still works? I'm thankful for the power of the blood tonight. Hebron was a place of shared spoil. A place of shared spoil. It said that David in 1 Samuel chapter 30, it's in your notes, verses 21, David came to the 200 men which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide by the book Bezor, and they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men and the men of Belial, those that went with David, and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us, and delivered from the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this manner? Be as his part is that goeth down to the battle. So shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And what was happening here was that uh, some of the men didn't have the strength to go into the battle and they stayed behind. And so the men that went into the battle, they had a triumph and a victory and the spoil was brought back. And, and they were saying, we're not going to share this with those that didn't fight the war. And David said, hold on a minute. We are. Because those that stayed by the stuff are as important as those that fought the battle. Those that didn't have the strength, they, they had given it all and, and, and they stopped at a particular place. They didn't have the strength to continue. And, and the soldiers that had the strength carried on, but, but some didn't make it into the battle. But David still said they gave everything that they had. Maybe, maybe their lot was unseen. They didn't make it to the battle because they bore the, the strength of the journey early on. Or maybe they were weary because of, of uh, physical challenges. But, but David said, we're, we're, we're not going to have a, a big I and a little you. If we are in this, then we are in this together. And, and I love that Hebron was that place of, of just kind of leveling the playing field. Because every one of us are, part, are important in the kingdom of God. Now I'm only one in, with, in the room with a microphone tonight. But here's what I know. Some of you could preach this part of the message a whole lot better than I could. There are people here in this room that, that maybe you were, you were the number one Christian on Monday. But tonight you're weary in body. You don't get thrown out with the trash because you're not number one Christian on Wednesday night. I'm not saying we're, we're not Christians. I'm just saying that we have to be careful that there's no big eyes and little U's. There are people in different places in the body doing different works, but that doesn't mean that they're less purpose, less, less part. David kind of leveled that playing field and said, whoa, just a minute. We're going to divide this evenly because we've all been in the battle together. We're all doing our part. So shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. Judgment day is going to be one great reckoning. There are some that many of us wouldn't want to stand beside because we will be humbled by the work in the kingdom they did unseen and unrewarded for. Be careful because be careful that we don't start grading on our scale. Because God grades on a different scale altogether. There are some heroes in this room that maybe have never held a microphone. But they have been a tremendous part of the kingdom advancing in this city, in this region. I believe that. And there is a day coming when, when that is all divided evenly because God knows the end from the beginning and sees all things. 
So be careful. Be careful that we don't draw comparison because God has a plan for every single person to be blessed, to be rewarded, and to be honored because of the work that they have done. If you could, I'd ask you to reach your arm around and pat yourself on the back. Because some of you have done a phenomenal job working in the kingdom and, and you give yourself a hard time sometimes because you haven't made it to the very end of the battle in full fighting form, but it's because you have waged war longer than many of us. And we love you. We appreciate you. If you value your elders tonight, would you give them a hand? And I'm not even looking around because I know right now most of the elders in the room are probably clapping for the other elders. But I appreciate the heritage and the history that we have. And God has a reward for all of us because we're fighting in the same battle, maybe on different fronts, but God has a reward. That happens in Hebron. What God gives us, he designs that we should that we should distribute that evenly and, and let blessing flow through the body. And I thank you for your prayers and I thank you for your giving. It's, it's remarkable. It's, it's just amazing how our church, you are such a blessing to the kingdom of God. It's awesome. I already had you clap, so I won't make you clap again, but we, we just give you great honor. Number 11, we'll just quickly go through these. It was a place of weeping. It's inevitable that Hebron is a place of weeping in our life. We know we know in 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 32, that when Abner was buried in Hebron, that David lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. There are seasons in our life where, where there will be weeping, sorrow. But the Bible also tells us that he that goeth forth bearing precious seed shall weeping. Don't, don't, don't skip that word. He that goeth forth bearing precious seed weeping shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. There are seasons of weeping in our life. There are seasons of discouragement. There are seasons of true sorrow. But don't reject the idea that God isn't in the middle of that. God's plan, his purpose, is sometimes revealed in the midst of that weeping. And we will doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing our sheaves with us if we endure that season of weeping. Number 12, a place of union. All the tribes in 2 Samuel chapter 5, 1. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron and spake, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in times past, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that led us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be captain over Israel. It was a place of that place of uniting. Uniting the tribes of Israel. They came to David in Hebron. Hebron was a place of service for David. I know that we read Jerusalem. We know Jerusalem is that place of prominence in Scripture. But before Jerusalem, there was a place called Hebron. Hebron, the last point, it was the place of anointing. When those tribes came to David in Hebron, it was because he had been in Hebron for seven and a half years, serving as king over Judah. But God moved David from Judah to Jerusalem over the entire kingdom of, of Israel and Judah at that point. But he served first in Hebron. It was that place of union, and then there was the place of anointing. And God has a plan to unite the church, and God has a plan to anoint the church if we live in that place called Hebron. I wonder if you'd stand together with me tonight. That's just a topical study on a place called Hebron, but how many want to live the topic tonight? How many believe that we can? The significance of that locale, the significance of that place, it means a community, an alliance. We can live that, we can allow that to be a part of our life, and we can let Hebron become a place of significance that brings us into a place of spiritual growth. Someone say, in Jesus' name. Father, I'm so thankful for the power of your word. And God, the promises that are attached to it. And God, I believe that every one of these places that we peruse tonight, God, that we looked over, 
have great meaning to different individuals in different seasons in their life tonight. So I pray that your courage would come through your word. You said that it's a lamp to, to feed, it's a light to path. And God, I pray that it would light someone's path. God, bring clarity and understanding. Let your word bring strength and courage, I pray. We love you tonight. Would someone just lift your voice for a moment and let that place of communion begin here. Make a commitment that you're going to allow that to be a part of your, your life, your home, your future, your family. That you're not going to get discouraged or dismayed. That you're going to, that you're going to wage war with the enemy if necessary. That you're going to commit and commune. That you're going to be a, uh, it's going to be a place of separation where God calls you into a brand new place. Just make a commitment tonight. I, I just want the word. If, if something just resonated in your spirit through the word of God tonight, just let that settle in your spirit before we leave. God, thank you. Thank you for talking with us tonight. God, some of the prayers that we've prayed, some of the impossibilities that the enemy would like to project on us, I, I thank you that you showed us a way out, a way through tonight, through your word. And I ask, Father, that you would lead us. God, direct us. The power of the Holy Ghost rest on us. God, I pray that intercession would happen and communion, all those things, that it be a part of our life, I pray. In Jesus' name. Someone speak his name. In Jesus' name. God bless you. We're dismissed. We're back together on Saturday evening for prayer. It's been good to be in study with you tonight.